up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in again. I am your favorite convicted felon here. Always am. And welcome back to Felons and Friends, a podcast where we talk about all real life events, life lessons, just to kind of give people, you know, an insight and a sense of hope for the future. Today, I have a special guest with me. He is not only a good friend of mine, but a mentor as well. I have my friend Joseph here with me today. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Joseph Martin. I am currently the president and CFO of Victory Health Incorporated. Um, actually, that is a <clears throat> it is a business where we are a uh, residential provider for people with intellectual disabilities. So kind of in layman's terms, they're group homes. Um, people always ask me, you know, what is that? What does that mean? Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and so being a group home for in layman's terms, kind of narrowed it down exactly what we do. Um, our job is we kind of come in and we just basically see that people with intellectual disabilities or autism, mm-hmm. they just get through their day-to-day um, daily needs. So, you know, we'll come in if they need to go to the grocery store, we'll make sure they get to the grocery store, getting the things they need, getting to their doctor's appointments, psychiatry appointments, so on and so forth. In the home, um, you know, we help keep things clean, tidied up for them, um, just basically assist them. Okay. Um, there's all different levels of our consumers, so um, which means they have all different levels of need. So some are very high functioning, um, don't really need too much assistance. And then you have others that have a high level of, of attention that needs. Yeah, the constant care. It's like a 24-hour. Yeah, they're, they're all, it's a, it's a 24-hour program, uh, 24-7. Mm-hmm. So um, there's always somebody there. But like I said, based on their needs level, some people need, Two staff to one. Yeah. Um, Some people live in an environment where it's just them and one staff. Some of them live where they have a roommate. Yeah. What got you into that business? Um, Originally, uh, a friend of mine, he was doing the business. And um, I have a compassion for working with people and helping people. Mm -hmm. So that's what kind of drew me to specifically that business. And he kind of brought me in. A childhood friend showed me the ropes. And I saw that it was something that I could make an impact and help people um, in, in the community and be an advantage to uh, some people that are given advantage, excuse me, to some people that are less advantaged than, than, we than others. Yeah, that's what's up. That's a big that's a big task to um, to have to do to be able to give yourself um, constantly, you know, whether it's a passion or not. Just having to um, having to have to maintain that responsibility to know that, you know, you are, you know, helping other people at that capacity to where they're incapable of doing it themselves. Um, So biggest thing, I guess, that really like struck me with you was that um, you shared with me that you're a felon. And how did you see, I guess, like, did you, I guess, like try to go back out into like the job market um, as far as like, you know, after serving your time, what did that, what did that look like for you when you, um, when well, you got well, actually, actually while I was incarcerated, um, obviously I knew I was going to be coming home. So I used that time to prepare myself, um, physically, mentally, and spiritually. I think it's very important for us to be in balance. Balance is, is key. Uh, we are, um, I am a Christian. Um, and so you know, uh, I, I believe that we are we are tripartites. You are a body. You have a spirit. You you, you live in us. Um, you, you excuse me. You are a spirit. You have a body. Uh, you have a body. You, you have a soul. Excuse me. And you uh, you live in, in your body. Um, yeah. And so it's very important for us to balance to have a have a balance. And so while I was incarcerated, um, I really focused on being balanced. Um, I think that's very very important. And what that balance meant, um, you know, obviously was working on the physical, working on the spiritual, the mental and the mental aspect was what was I going to do when I came home? Um, and so initially coming home, obviously, I know it's going to be a felon. I know recidivism is very, very high. I think it's about 89 percent. Um, a lot of people that, you know, eventually do return back to prison. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I prepared myself and um, I actually opened up a carpet cleaning business is what I initially did. Okay. Um it's called organic dry carpet cleaning. I started in Washington, D.C. area. Um, and I just kind of went out and <clears throat> kind of 
basically grinded my way just like everybody else when they come home, um, grinded my way and was able to be successful at that. Um, had a few employees and was kind of doing that for about three, four years until I ran into the opportunity as we were speaking on one yeah. now. So um, currently we're in our seventh year of running that business and um, it's going pretty well. So you had to go back to, um, well, you made a plan. That's the, that's, I guess, like a key thing. Did you make a plan? Oh, absolutely. In a sense? A- absolutely. While I was incarcerated, um, and I think everything has to start with a plan. Uh, people ask me, what do I, you know, how do I start a business? And the first thing I tell them, well, you need to write a business plan. Yeah. Sit down and, and put your thoughts on a piece of paper or, you know, computer or whatever, but put your thoughts down. And then you can have somebody kind of go over it that has some experience, not just being in business, but, you know, you really kind of want to find somebody who, if possible, is working in the same business that you're looking to get into. Yeah. Because all businesses obviously are different. But at that point, you know, uh, I did a lot of work basically having limited access to information being incarcerated. Yeah. But I did as best I could. And I found another friend of mine that I met while I was incarcerated and he kind of helped me set things up and plan things up. So when I hit the, when I hit, when I was released, I would hit the ground running. Yeah. I was pretty much ready to go. Yeah. That's a good thing. I know mm-hmm. um, for myself personally, I didn't really have a plan. I didn't have a plan at all. It was just, okay, when I get done, um, you know, with jail, I'm going to just go back to work. I gotta, I gotta go back to work. Luckily, like I kind of played it off like, okay, um, I'm gonna be using some time off for like mental health, you know, probably, I don't know if I should disclose that or not. <laughs> don't disqualify me from work, y'all, if y'all see this. But, you know, just, um, that's how, that's the only plan that I had just for me going away, just serving the short amount of time that I did. I just did 10 days in jail. Like I was still in county, right. didn't have to go to prison, praise God. But um, still, you know, just having to having to maneuver my way around. OK, well, what am I going to do when I get out? I knew that I had a job. Some people, you know, they get out in those situations and they have no other choice but to return back to, you know, selling drugs, you know, being on the streets, making money, you know, however they see fit, because that's all that, you know, you know, or either you lost your job, you're eligible to come back, you know, just little things like that. So for me, I didn't necessarily have like, you know. Um, like a grand plan for how I can elevate my life in that aspect. But, you know, you did how many years? Oh, uh, five years. Five years. So, yeah. So that's that's plenty of time to, you know, right. you know, get your get yourself together. Absolutely. Um, I agree with you. Uh, you know, if I only had to do 10 days, um, obviously, that's not enough time to get a plan together. Yeah. <laughs> 10 days. You're already thinking about when you're going to be released. Yeah. Where. Um, my period of incarceration gave me um, a lot of me time, a lot of downtime, so I could kind of get back to focus on what I did wrong, what yeah. I did right, um, and to kind of build upon that. You know, unfortunately, you know, I've seen individuals incarcerated with, you know, um, longer periods of time than I had, and you know, they kind of just wrecked all day and worked out or whatever. You know, yeah. play cards, chess, and, you know, they didn't do anything to prepare themselves. And then that day comes, obviously, and you're released. Yeah. And then next thing you know, you're right back in. Yeah, because you, you don't have anything else to fall back on. And, and, and unfortunately, I think a lot of that is, um, uh, it's done by design. I, I, I'm gonna say yeah, that absolutely. Way. Um, <clears throat> especially for, for people who are, um, are brown and black tend to um, not have the same opportunities and levels of opportunities um, mm-hmm. coming from different neighborhoods yeah uh, that other people do so we kind of once you get in that system yeah that it's system, that's a wrap it just, <laughs> it just keeps going round and round and round, and round yeah i noticed too like um while i was in jail it was very um i wouldn't say like militia like but i mean to an extent it was just more so of like the harsh, um, the harsh demands and stuff that were just put on different inmates and stuff. So it became like, okay, I can tell that, you know, like you're trying to break a person mentally. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, if a woman, for example, in, um, the 10 days I was in there, first day I got in there, 
um, it took them three days to get me to a cell. So the whole time I'm just in holding with random people coming in and out. And um, it got to the point to where it's like, okay, as a woman, like I start my cycle. So now you're sitting here, you know, trying to tell an officer like, hey, hey, I need I need sanitary napkins. I need something to be able to, you know, maintain some form of, you know, humanity as a woman, some kind of, you know, dignity to an extent. But they're like, you don't need that. How are you going to tell me I don't need a pad? Like, you know, you can you can go and come as you please to go to a grocery store and get what it is that you need. But now your livelihood, my livelihood is in your hands. And to just see how little things like that, how it was just played out just as a woman, just, you know, it's inhumane. But right, absolutely. And on that level, um, the county level where there's a, a uh, I say a higher turnover. Yeah. And then being in prison. Um, in the higher up of the levels that you go, you're going to see less movement on people moving in and out. So um, as far as the quality of life, if I can use that word, um, when you get to a, a, a more uh, prison setting versus yeah. a county jail setting, um, <clears throat> it is a little it's easier because you have more access um, versus, you know, the the inhumane treatment. Obviously, I, yeah. I'm, you know, in order to get to the prison, you have to go that route. Yeah. Um, what you're saying. So I'm, I'm very, very familiar with that. Um, to be specific, you know, I was I was incarcerated in the federal prison prison system. Um, and so one of the uh, areas that when they're moving you from prison to prison is uh, USP Atlanta. They have a hold over there and um, it is brutal. It, it really is yeah. um, when you're talking about inhumane treatment and uh, anybody in the federal system that has been through that particular holdover, um, they can tell you that it's not it's not nice. You know, you're locked up basically three um, for 23 hours a day. Oh wow! And when they do let you out, you have an option uh, with your with your hour, and that option is either one you can go take a shower, yeah, you can B, use the phone, you can use the phone, <laughs> or C, you can go outside and yeah, area just look around, just look around. <laughs> that's, that's how it. it was. That's how it was for me. I had just one hour, so exactly. I go take my shower real quick, hop on the phone. So I take like a 10 minute shower and then it's like, all right. Well, and, and this is what I'm saying. It's, it's a little different. Like yeah. you get to pick one. What do yeah. you want to do today? Oh, just one. Yeah. Would you like to use the phone? Oh, then wow. But phone. you can't scrub your butt. No. If you choose to do the shower. <laughs> That's that crazy. Place. Don't, don't go there. That's well, crazy. you don't get a choice. Yeah. It's, it's not an option. <laughs> system, it's, it's not an option. That's so, crazy. I, yeah. Either that, that, and then, you know, there's, there were times, uh, specifically, um, that the the guards will come in and they we're not even turning the key. We're not gonna let you out of the day. Oh so, wow! And, and you're in a cell specifically that's designed for two people, and there's six, seven, eight people. I mean, wow! You can on the floor, underneath the bunk, and it's an older prison, so you know. I remember rats just running in. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it's, it, it, it can be it can be trying. So yeah, I'm, and I'm addressing the inhumane issue that you're speaking. Yeah, that's um, so crazy. I, I've had that experience. I can understand, you know, like. Money wise, because that's all it is typically about, you know, like if I had a prison, I'd run it the same way. But it's like, to what extent, you know, are you going to allow to, you know, keep treating people in this capacity? It's just it's bad. It's terrible. When people start sleeping on the floors, it's like, hey, you got enough money to invest in more beds. But instead, you know, I'm gonna go buy a yacht. So that's where we're at. That's that's how I see it being done. Um, so mentally, like, did you have any, I guess, like mental changes, any mental growth, mental health impacts that you had to overcome, I guess, like going into knowing like, hey, you're going to be going into prison for this amount of time? Yeah, I think um, when when you're dealing with the uh, federal penal system, um, one of the things is it's it's a lot of unknown. I've had experience dealing with the state um, system and it, it, it's night and day difference. Um, number one, we're talking to a, a, a system where the conviction rate is 95%. So yeah. pretty much, you know, you're going to jail yeah. when things happen. Um, and what that time period is going to look like, you know, all of that kind of puts a lot of strain on your mental. So, uh, for me, the relief was, um, specifically when I got to prison. Okay. I know what I have to do and I know when I'm going home. So now 
We're just going to walk through it. So there was a lot of the mental issue or the mental strain on me was prior to me reporting to to the prison um, and starting my sentence. Hmm. Um, but once I was once I was in, like I said, you know, it was maybe about two, three weeks, you know, of trying to figure some things out because I'd never been incarcerated before. Um, but once I got past that. Oh, point, dang, it was your first time and you went straight to prison. You just- yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, that 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 was pretty much the story. Um I had a lot of encounters with the state system, but yeah. um I don't even want to say I was fortunate because maybe if if it didn't turn that way, then, you know, this, yeah. this situation wouldn't went that way. But um with the state system I was never I was never uh sentenced to do any time. Mm. Okay. Um so I I had some pretty good lawyers and you know, yeah. There was a lot of maneuvering, shuffling, um, but eventually, when the feds came to to see me, that things changed really quickly. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, you know, that process involved, you know, it was it was a lot of um, it, it was different from me using it to deal with the state system um, yeah. versus the, the the federal system. But once I was <clears throat> incarcerated, and I was, you know, kind of after about the three week period, I would say. You know, when I kind of learned the ropes on kind of this is how it goes. And this, is, yeah. this is what it is. Um, at that point, you know, I began to first focus on where I was going to be at spiritually and kind of did a lot of focus in there. And then from there, you know, kind of brought in the the physical aspect of what I was going to do on a day to day routine. And yeah. Also, the, 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 the mental where I was going to be um, what I when I got out, uh, I was determined not to come back to prison. Yeah, um, and I figured that you know there was there was a lot of opportunities. You know, when I was placed in a situation where, you know, me personally, I'm I'm one probably the worstest thing you can do is sit me down and make me think. Yeah, um, <laughs> they should um, never gave you a book. Yeah, they, yeah, they, <laughs> they 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 let me think, and so as I was able to think and start thinking about some things, um, I realized that hey, you know, there's some opportunities to be able to do different things and. Just kind of always more so I keep my head on a swivel, not being closed minded. Yeah. Um, and just allow just to think through things, because that's one of the things that I noticed a lot about even when <clears throat> I was released. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we have this label that we're convicted felons. Or we've been incarcerated. And it's supposed to be this. It is this black mark in society. But I realized that, number one. Um, I was coming home to, as you were talking about the mental aspect, Yeah, I was coming home to a lot of people that I realized personally, like you're mentally not stable. You're mentally not healthy. You need not necessarily prison, but you need some, some, some mental, thinking time. <laughs> well, not even just that, but you, you need some, there's a lot of people that I come across that really need some professional mental um, help. Yeah. Um, so I, I think especially in the black community, we need therapy in the black community. I, I'd say just cross the board. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> people therapy. Don't. I told you about therapy. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, you know, um, it, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, but being able to to be in that situation um, and I went through a program in while I was in the federal prison system. Um, it's called RDAP. Well, it's a residential drug pro drug uh, program, okay. um, and I, I basically particularly took it to help get some reduction on my time on, on my sentence. Yeah, to go through that program. Um, but I did find that even though I wasn't an addict using drugs, um, I found it very very helpful, and I, I picked up a lot of tools that I was able to utilize as I come out, and I still utilize them to this day. Yeah, um, to be able to kind of assess, you know, what's rational. What's not what's not rational? Yeah. On the last episode, I talked about going to rehab and how rehab was like one of the best situations that I could have put myself. Well, I didn't put myself in, but that I agreed to do and actually participate in Mm -hmm. willingly. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't want to go because I didn't believe like, you know, alcoholics is is not a problem. Like I just drink too much. Mm -hmm. But to the point to where now, like I'm starting to see, you know, how much it actually affects, you know, people's livelihood. You know, some people can't function without it. Some people, you know, you get it and then, you know, you're doing good. But then it's like, oh, 
you way off in the deep end now, baby, behind, you know, a tequila shot that you know that, you know, you know that you have an issue with, but you don't want to acknowledge it. And um, just those different tools and stuff that I learned while in rehab, it's just I still use them to this day, just knowing, hey, these are safe coping mechanisms. If you see, you know, something, you know, triggers you a bit, think about it in a different aspect, you know, think through it wholeheartedly, thoroughly, try to see it from all perspectives and then move about it, you know, in the most reasonable and responsible way that, you know, doesn't hurt other people. And then if it does, but it's best for you to do so, then you have to do what's best for you. Absolutely. Um, I went to rehab really just trying to run away from going to jail. I don't know, like if rehab kind of helped and they were like, oh, okay, I guess she's going to try to get help now. Mm-hmm. But um, I had an ankle monitor, I had an ankle monitor and a breathalyzer in my car. I had a, um, one that I had to carry with me all the time. So it's like wherever I go, I'd have to blow the alcohol monitor on my ankle is always reading the alcohol. The one that I had to keep with me would go off at certain times of the day where I had to take a picture with my phone, like blown into the breathalyzer, uploaded to the app. That way the county sees it. Okay. Just that whole, that whole little, I don't know, that whole punishment. It was just like torture. Mm-hmm. But that whole, that whole situation that I had to go through with all three of those devices, it became um, very taxing on me mentally okay. just to know that, you know, When I get out of rehab or get out of jail, I'm still going to have to pay for these devices. So for all of those devices, I'm throwing out, you know, like like a band, a band a month, two thousand dollars. Just all right. This this is money for these things, these nice Apple features that Apple had never released. But the state did. You feel me? I had to I had to pay for that every month. So for me coming up now in August, this is like. This is like the best time. Like I don't have to, I don't have to give out $500 anymore. I don't have to pay this, you know, this $500. I have, I have my own, you know, accountability for myself personally, just to know that this is something that I went through and I don't want to go back there. So that's been like my whole, like my whole mentality coming up to being done with this entire probation period. Cause it's, it's straining for people that, you know, don't have a job. Maybe they, you know, they sat around on their butt for two years and didn't come up with, you know, a plan. So to say Mm -hmm. that's what, you know, you can, it's easy to fall back into it. It's real simple to fall back into that routine, but just, just the, the thought that like, okay, I can keep my money. I can, I can actually go to Jamaica. Like I don't have to go to rehab. I could just, you know. So your rehab, your rehabilitation program, what th- what did that look like? How long was it? it- um, it was a thirty day period. I did the thirty day um the thirty day treatment plan. Mm-hmm. They have thirty days, sixty days, ninety days, um, depending on you know however long you feel as though you need treatment. Okay. And for mine, it was all in house, so I had to stay there day and night, thirty days in a facility. Um, I had a roommate, mm-hmm. and it was maybe like um it was probably like sixteen maybe like 16 or 20 other women and um they had men there as well but we were all just in separate wards they had people um to monitor you know to make sure that nobody's you know creeping over into other people's you know wards and everything but um yeah got three meals a day had some recreational time um we had courses that we had to attend to classes where they were therapy classes so with um, a counselor, we got to unpack trauma, just um, kind of peeling back, you know, the layers as to why did you start this? When was your first time, you know, using this drug? Why did you use it? Were you forced to use it? Was it like peer pressure? After that, how did it spiral into, you know, you continuing the situation to where you got yourself into this hole that you're in now? Right. So for me, it took me a while to kind of... um no, it didn't even take me a while. It took me like three days. Like the first three days I was there was like, dang, this is the best help I could have ever gotten. It was kind of like, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but just to see how quickly, if you allow yourself to be open to it, just how quickly, you know, you can actually begin to acknowledge it and then start being able to grow mm-hmm. in that aspect from, um, <clears throat> just from me being there for like three, four days, it was like days. So when the judge called me, he was like, Miss Hill, you're trying to skip court. It ain't going down like that. I mean, see you nine o'clock in the morning, Harris County. 
I need to see you front center courtroom 186. You need to be there. And I'm like, dang, bro, like I'm trying to get the help I need. You're trying to take me to jail. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I'm trying to do the work, bro. Give me, give me a break. But got there and um he said, okay, we know. Are you learning anything there? I'm like, yes. <laughs> Over the past six years of me having a drinking issue, I'm just now getting the help it is that this is the most help that I've gotten in six years. Aside from me, you know, going in and out of jail, going in and out of jail, it's not doing anything. It's just costing you money, costing you your time. You're paying the state because they don't really care if you fix your problem or not. They're just going to, you know, they're going to reprimand you for it. They're going to get their money. So from that, that was the, that was the best help. So I think one of the, um, so for me, um, the program, as I stated before, yeah, I, I, I initially took the program and signed up for the program to get uh, time off of my sentence. Yeah. Um, but this program is nine months, oh. um, and it's basically while you're incarcerated, it's it's uh, morning and afternoon, so um, you're, you're you're pretty much tied up all day, and it's it it is intense. And initially, you know, probably maybe like month one, I'm just like I'm just here to breeze through, but then I started realizing that there are a lot of other components that go to um, the name of it is RDAP. So it's the uh, residential drug and alcohol program that's, that's in the federal prison system. Um, And what I've realized is there are a lot of other um, issues or components that go with why one tends to abuse drugs or alcohol. Um, And even though I wasn't specifically an abuser in the sense of a user, um, I was still, you know, participating in that lifestyle, um, being, being, uh, uh, selling drugs. So at that point, you know, I realized that coming into the, um, coming into the, the, the aspect of where people are coming from or what are the components that lead to it. And there's a lot of things dealing with your, your home life, um, the structure of your home life. Um, how you're thinking, how you think about things. Yeah. So it got very, very, very intense. Um, and, and it was it, like I said, it's it's still I still use a lot of the tools that I learned in that program yeah. and apply it to today. Um, and like I stated, you know, one of the biggest things I have a f- few other friends who participated in that. And, you know, as we kind of conversate from time to time, we talk about how many people need to do what we call an RSA is as a rational self-analysis yeah um and and there, there's a lot of people that's just out here struggling um and yeah. they, they need therapy that's that's really what it is yeah that's like whenever i tell people you know like yeah i have four duis and they're like dang four duis i'm like yeah but you know how many times have you gone out drank and drove and you know you just didn't get caught absolutely so absolutely. it's um it's a it's a thing you know where people If people don't have those resources to know, hey, you know, I could utilize this or be open minded to the idea of even seeing just, you know, trying to trying to be open minded to it, then people would be able to see and understand like, okay, you can you're able to do your RAS, you know, your self analysis and everything. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so spiritually, Mm -hmm. um, when I was in jail got to the holding cell in the back and I ended up meeting a young lady and we both had the same lawyer. And I'm like, Hmm, we both got the same lawyer, but come to find out she, um, she was kind of new into her Christianity. Mm -hmm. And for me, I've, um, I've been a Christian my whole life raised in church. So like this whole ordeal of me going to jail and stuff, me acting out is kind of like, Oh my God, we need to pray over her. Like what's wrong with her. And, um, it's, it's just, um, it's different things that we have to go through just as Christians, as people that I'm starting to realize now that um, God will put you in places and in situations for you to be able to pour out into other people just to let them know like, hey, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm not perfect. My shoes get dirty too, but this is where I'm at now. And this is how I help make, you know, I help make my life better, help contribute to other people. Um, I ended up telling her about, you know, about God, just giving her encouragement, her sentence. I don't want to share it, but it was really bad. Mm-hmm. It was kind of like you like she went to jail for the first time, but it was just it was like, dang, like you're going to be gone a minute. But, right. you know, um, so just being able to um, just to share that word, that piece of um, encouragement to other people. Um, 
Did you have any moments like that while you were incarcerated or anything that you just like to openly share to people who might be going through um, a time period of being incarcerated or coming out of incarceration, might be going into it, you know? Um, <clears throat> well, like I said, you know, when when I when I first was incarcerated, um, as yourself, I am a Christian um, and um, I have a Christian background, uh, father being a minister. One of the things that I kind of took upon myself is, you know, I kind of said, you know, I'm going to kind of scratch everything and I'm going to start from the beginning. I kind of took myself through a process where I, I wasn't, I wanted to think things out for myself, you know, not just run around here. A lot of people say they're Christians. Yeah. Um, but what was it that I believe? And so, you know, I kind of started and I looked at all of these religions, honestly, and I started to kind of decipher between you know, what I thought was this, what was that based on, you know, different Bibles, whether it's the Quran or the, the, the Talmud or even uh, the, the Bible. And then, you know, as I kind of settled in on one particular book, obviously, which was the Bible, then I began to try to understand what was the truth that comes out of that, how that was put together. And, you know, I did a lot, a lot, a lot of studying. Yeah. Of study. um, and as far as, you know, my interaction um, you know, that that environment you're going to run into um, on a prison setting, people of all different forms of beliefs. Yeah. Um, and it actually was helpful for me because um, I particularly remember this one young, this one gentleman and um, he was a Seventh Day Adventist. So, you know, he part of the Christian faith, but there's a lot of a lot of differences in what I understand by the Bible to be. Mm. But he was the one that, you know, was pretty much dug into what his denomination taught. And yeah. that really forced me to understand what it is that I believe um, and gave me a real rooted foundation in understanding scripture because he, he sent me back to my, my cube many a nights with my Bible trying to, you know, read and understand and, and, and learn. Um, yeah. So that I would say that was one of my major impacts. And then obviously, then as I moved throughout my sentence, you know, I became more involved in some like minded thinking Christians and have met several men that we, we, we still have enjoy a friendship to this day. Um, and we were impactful as a unit um, and me individually in speaking to people and impacting different people's lives while they were in person. Yeah, that's what's up. That's what's up. That's a big, big thing that like that drew me to you when we first um when we first met. He was like, Yeah, yeah, I'm a felon. I was like, Why you a felon? Then it was like, Well, first it was you're a Christian and then it was like, You're a felon too. And it was like, dang, he's a he's a Christian man who drops gems like intelligent intelligent y'all can't can't put it into that's the only word i can really use right now just intelligent thank you and absolutely and um it was like okay i know for sure that i can learn something from you mm -hmm. being in um in the situation that i've been in you know with me having to overcome the mental things like you'll tell me all the time you know that doesn't define you you know you just I get to live a different path. I get to have a, you know, I get to have a different path in life as opposed to just the regular, regular, every day, go to work, you know, because now it, it becomes, okay, you know, you, you've you already done the creative part by just going to jail. So now I can utilize, you know, those different things that I've learned just in life in general. Um, So I guess a piece of encouragement um, to give those watching Thanks for tuning in to I know y'all still here because it is an interesting conversation to be able to um, to gain perspective, just to know that, no, you're not the only person going through it. He's not the only person going through it either. But um, just to utilize your time, if you do see yourself going into the system, like Joseph said, you know, utilize your time wisely. If you're doing a long sentence, you know, you're in there by yourself. Nobody else is going in into jail with you. You're going in there by yourself. So you have to start making those, you know, conscious decisions, conscious efforts, you know, to know when you get out of when you get out of your sentence, what is it that you're going to do to change 
that path, that trajectory that you're on? How are you going to change your life from there on? Or do you want to stay in the same situation and keep eating bologna sandwiches? That's up to you. The bread is stale. I'm letting you know right now. Cookies, two out of 10. Simple. So, you know, just, you know, what are the what are the little things, you know, that you'll do to build yourself up to prevent you from going back? Because the world is going to keep spinning. It's going to keep evolving. And either you can sit there and not do anything about it or you can sit there and implement a plan into your life that will help you get to where it is that you need to be or at least get back on a steady track to where, you know, you don't have to fall back into the system. It's a um, it's a big thing. That's a big thing that you did, you know, knowing and realizing, hey, I have to utilize my time. I got to use, utilize my time wisely just in this capacity to where, you know, you're not just sitting around because me for 10 days, I was like, OK, I guess I'll read a book. I read maybe like 15 bucks. This that's all I had to do. Wake up at four o'clock in the morning, eat breakfast. They cut the lights on around like five fifteen. Like, you know, so I, that's all I had to do all day. I get out one hour, go shower, call my mom's up, call my dad. Can't get no commissary because I only did 10 days. So by the time I got in, I missed commissary. Make sure that you know where your commissary is, you know, right. save $10 or something. Save you some money so you can have somebody. Hey, can you put this on my books when I go in? Make sure that you're utilizing your network um correctly if you don't have, um, you know, like good family or friends, I suggest that you find some. I don't know how it works when people don't have family. I don't know how it works. Praise God. I got a I got a good family, you know, that had my back. But um, if you don't have any good family members or anything, I suggest finding a church home. Um, if you find a church home. Hopefully, you know, you can implement those people into your life as well. They're able to pour into you in the positive you know, in a positive direction that you need, they're able to help you out. Um, That's the only thing. That's really the only thing I can think of. Anything else you want to share before we um, we wrap up? Yeah, I think um, even just touching on that end point, um, I think a lot of things um, when we were, when I was initially talking about um, the environment, our environment, um, and we all come from different, different walks. Um, Obviously, as you're stating that you do have a good family, but there are people that come from, very, very challenging situations, which includes their family yeah. or possibly even their friends. Um, but I will say this, you know, um, bad company corrupts good character. Um, so you must, must watch who you're around. You must, must um, really, really take in, take a, a, a inventory of who those people are that are around you. Because, you know, if, if you're around, you know, I, I was taught young, that, you know, if you're around nine broke friends, you bound to be the 10. Yeah. But that's also applicable to, that's also applicable also to the character. You know, if you're around nine criminals, you bound to be the 10th. Yeah. You know, so whatever it is, um, you know, you are who, who you keep around who you keep, the company that you keep. Birds of a feather. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so like you said, like you just said, you know, it, it, it is very, very, very important. If anything is going to be the takeaway, it's, you know, kind of focus. Look at who you're around. If you're coming home to a bad situation, um, meaning the people, yeah, get away from them. Yeah. You know, go get a tent, go sleep outside and, and, and start from there. That's going to be a lot better than being around some some folks that just are going to pull you back down. And you're going to find yourself right back in the same. Absolutely. Well, thanks for um for being my guest today you're my very first guest here on the show very first guest everybody i love it so thanks for joining me today um as always tune in next week tune into the very next episode that we'll have available and again this is felons and friends